it's very rural, even though there's the sort of idea of a city, it's actually the, within 10 minutes you're in a rural part of the country. It's very conservative. It is the only province that disallowed Indian South Africans from staying overnight. So even as late as the 1990s, 80s, late 80s, early 90s, when the Chief Justice was an Indian, Justice Ismail Muhammad, he, this is the most senior judge in the country for the Supreme Court of Appeals, which is here, he would have to drive home every night to go and sleep in Kimberley, which is one and a half hours away, and then drive back the next morning. <laughs> because of this bizarre and, and fairly unique uh, uh, policy for the Free State Republic, as it used to be called, Orange Free State Republic, that it wouldn't have Indian South Africans. Obviously, commercial economic competition was, and the racism lay behind it. But the because the province is so isolated, it never had the major ideological and and diversities that you would find in Devon or Cape Town or Johannesburg. So there was never a Communist Party here. There was never a strong Jewish community here. There was never a obviously a Muslim, uh, you know, community here. Um, you basically had two crude nationalisms. Uh, the Afrikaner nationalism, which is the white Afrikaners, and Basutu nationalism. Um, and so there's no jazz club, which is, tells you immediately, you know, there's a problem <laughs> in terms of... So in part the university is seen by the people who've lived here forever, particularly white people, as a problem as an anomaly, as a threat. So I get regular death threats, I get regular letters, you know, that insult me, etc., etc. Not because of me, but because of a sense that the university is no longer a home for conservative, racist, uh, Afrikaans-speaking people. And I'll send you a piece on the demise of my of the first black university president at Stellenbosch University, which is very similar to this university in terms of the history and the culture. And the guy just dropped dead the other day. And I asked the question, who killed him? And of course, you can imagine, <laughs> caused a little bit of an uproar in the country. But I'll send it to you to give you a sense of the challenge of transformation in a place that used to be reserved for white people, and in this case for white people of Afrikaner, of, of Dutch, mainly Dutch, but also a little bit of French, and, uh, um, Belgian descent. So all I can tell you is that I find this job incredibly stimulating. Um, I had similar experiences, as you know, at the University of Pretoria. That's why I wrote this book. You could write the same book here, um, which is both a story of incredible um, conservatism alongside a story of hope. And so I obviously prefer to focus on the complexities of hope um, and so on. So here's the big question. If you have a university, as a case in point, that for years didn't allow black people onto the campus except as servants, as cleaners, and so on, what happens when you suddenly throw people together? Okay. Now this is a dilemma for South Africa. It was not a dilemma in post-war Germany, because they basically killed the Jews or drove them out. But we had to live together, just as in your country, the slaves and the slave owners had to find a way of living together. And that, as you know from your own experience, is not easy. And the question is, how do you change it? So I have no interest in being a victim. I have no interest in sitting back. I don't come to this university feeling it's somebody else's university. This is my bloody university. I pay taxes for it, and I remind people about that every day, that it's a public institution and I'm in charge. Now, I don't say that to be arrogant. I say that to take away the notion that you still own the place. Mm -hmm. We own the place. Mm -hmm. 
And I make that very clear, especially to right-wing people. Okay, get used to it. And I'm comfortable with that. Okay. I can't care less about the parents. I do, but I don't really care about the parents. What I need to do is to take 33,000 students and put them in a different space. That is the leadership challenge. So that's the question. How do you put historical enemies together? And so students will tell you this perception that they're not getting the same treatment as students studying in Afrikaans. It's actually not true because a lot of the lecturers or the professors coming in don't speak Afrikaans. They come from, you know, increasingly. Mm. But the perception that I'm being done in is very strong. Mm. And sometimes it's great. Okay? So the next slide, please. So, as I said, there's a few options here. The one is annihilation, which was Germany. National socialism is another way of talking about Nazism. And they spoke openly about the final solution, if you recall that. Okay. In your country, people didn't speak so much about apartheid, but about segregation by Jim Crow, mm -hmm. you know. Um, even though it had features of apartheid and so on and so on. Then, of course, there's the whole notion of <clears throat> let's just tolerate each other, let's just get along, <laughs> okay. Um, which uh, is very much, I think, where South Africa is today, let's find a way of just getting along. You just stay in your space, <laughs> I'll stay in my space. That doesn't work for me. For me, I work at this university in this country to bring people together in a genuine mm -hmm. embrace, mm -hmm. as you'll see in a minute. That is the only way you, you get out of trouble. So, um, the problem with intimacy is it's always complicated, okay? Now I want you to imagine, this is what the book is about by the way, I want you to imagine a picture you might have seen in South Africa, which is a picture of a domestic worker, right? There's elements of this by the way in The Help, which you must have seen. And the domestic worker keeps the white child for the whole day on her back, tied tightly. I've seen this a lot in Cape Town where I grew up, right? This kid whose parents are often either working or drunk or away, not present, the kid gets handed over to the domestic. So the domestic is in fact the mother, the nurturer, the person raising that person. But as this kid hits puberty, and as language begins to develop, the kid realizes that even though I'm close, I'm not supposed to be. Mm. If you're interested in stories about this, go online to the Apartheid Archive. One word, one string, Apartheid Archive. Just Google that and it will come up. And there's amazing stories of white people sort of saying how they had to make sense of, on the one hand, being close, and on the other hand, not being close. <laughs> and how you had to learn the rules of, of, of close distance, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense, you know. Slavery in your country. Mm. This is the best book I've read in a long time. By a fellow called Schultz. She so goes to a county in Georgia, in your country, and he discovers that at the height of slavery in the South, by the way, I'll send all of this to Dad and if you want to. Thank you. Nicolino will actually send. <laughs> At the height of slavery in the South, there was a county in Georgia where black and white people got along. There were no lynchings. People actually had an agreement between themselves, among themselves, that prevented violence. He called this personalism a particular kind of relationship between white and black. When everywhere else, black people were being killed and, you know, abused and all that. In this county in Georgia, it wasn't like that. And so what he does in his book is to challenge the single narrative, the one story, which, of course, is always uninteresting from an intellectual point of view, because there's never one story, right? There's always different shades of of grey, if you will. 
transactional sense, not far from here is a place called Excelsior. Should be about 40 minutes drive from here. Zakes Madar, who is a professor uh, in your country at Ohio State, I think, he is actually from here. And he went there and wrote this amazing novel, actually, called The Madonna of Excelsior. So what happened in Excelsior? At the height of apartheid, white men, clergy, businessmen, left Bloemfontein and these areas and went to Excelsior and enjoyed, <laughs> to use public language, carnal relationship <laughs> with black <coughs> women. And they got a lot. And they paid for sex. And it went on for years until somebody, you know, exposed this and they arrested the woman. <laughs> wow, well, you know. Um, but you can imagine the sense of shame and guilt in a Calvinist culture, you know, of these white guys. But he, how do you make sense? Because the logic of apartheid was separation, right? Mm -hmm. Not being together. Mm -hmm. And yet, even in this most intimate of human activities, mm -hmm. white and black were together. So what does that mean, you know, uh, as a form of, um, of, of, of intimacy? Then, one of my other favorite books by Annette Gordon-Reed. Do you know what this book is about? Now guys, if I must tell you about books written in your country, <laughs> that's not good. This is, the, this is the story of Thomas Jefferson, right? Who has this black woman, uh, you know, called uh, Hemings, Sally, Hemings. Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings. And the second book of, of, of Gordon Reed is actually a book in which by now they have DNA evidence and all this kind of stuff to show that there was actually a very, very intimate relationship, not based on transactional sex, not based on coercion. So neither consent nor coercion explains that today. It appears to have been a genuine love relationship. And as you know, they are offspring to this day in different parts of the eastern seaboard. So here's the question. Why is it that this guy, during a period of slavery, has an official wife and yet another wife with whom he lived, particularly in the years in Paris. How do you explain these different forms of intimacy in cultures that, for decades, you know, enforce segregation of the races, as they were called? This doesn't make sense. How can you be intimate and dangerous at the same time? Mm. So, here's the dilemma, the question, the research question that forms the backdrop to all of this stuff. You've now all heard of the rates incident, right? Mm -hmm. In which these four white students abused the five black workers, four of whom are women, mm -hmm. twice their ages. So I was here, I came in the aftermath of that. In fact, the reason I came was because that event happened. I'm quite sure if it didn't happen, they would not have appointed the black president. That I'm sure. Mm. But because they were not desperate, the whole world saw this mm. horrific thing on YouTube. So I came for interviews, etc., and got the job. <laughs> and everybody looked at the video a million times, but with the same sort of conclusion. Here's a bunch of racist kids. And look at what horrible things they did. Now, again, for you guys as masters and PhD students and future PhD students, don't ever ask the same question that everybody else is asking. Find a different way of looking at the same thing. So here's what puzzled me, and nobody's written about this yet. Why is it that before and after this event, the workers, the black workers, and the white students claim to love each other. Anybody help me with that? How would you explain that? So, you want to give it a go? Why the, 
why the black workers and the white students said they loved each other after the event? Before, Before the event, during the event, after the event. No, <laughs> no. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. The black workers would say to me, and in their presence, we love these boys. The guys would say, we love these boys. How do you explain? Perhaps they knew each other and they took the time to speak and listen to each other. Not just that. You're right. Not just that. When the guys, most of whom came from farming families, went home over weekends or you know, recess, they would bring box loads of fruit and vegetables for their mothers, for these women, the woman in particular. The guy is sort of outside the story because he didn't really work where they work in the rest. When the students, wait for this, this is going to upset you, when the white guys overslept, and were late for classes. Those four women would go into their rooms and with a long, what's it, cowhide, a whip, whip them out of bed. Now I want you to just get this image. Here's four black women. Here's four white guys being whipped, saying, you're just not for class, you're late for class. Explain that to me. Can I? Yeah. I think I liken it to maybe the housemaids that they might have in their own homes. So just as we saw with the help, that example, that closeness that um, children are able to, to feel with the help or with those who take care of them um, when their parents are away, maybe close to what these students were able to feel when um, when they were here, and then it was only when the pressure of because if I'm not cor if I'm if I'm correct, it was like a an initi initiation sorry, mm -hmm. an initiation tactic that brought about this this act of disrespect, right? So they were trying to prove themselves to other white students in their living space. Well, they were also trying to use it to protest integration of the residents. Oh. Yeah, that's, what, that's really the goal, but you're right, by using initiation rituals. Okay, so I didn't realize that it was to protest the integration, but yeah. just thinking about it with the limited sure. sorry, amount of information that I have. Um, but yeah. is this possible? Is it possible to, to be so close to each other and actually hate each other? Not hate, I don't think the work, black work is hated these times. How do you explain this? This doesn't make sense. Yes, sir. I think they did it out of conform conformity, kind of tagging on to what Melinda is saying. They did it more so mm -hmm. so that they could do, they could follow a culture mm -hmm. that was set for them. However, in regards to what you said in the last slides, they were close. They are they are close to each other. Human nature. We're close to. We understand individuals. We have a sense of empathy. However when you're told that you're supposed to dislike a certain group by default using some Bayesian ideology you tend to follow that um, notion that's in front of you. Mm. Anybody else? Thank you sir. Yeah. I personally would see it as like spoiled children like in the sense of um, Sometimes with your parents, I mean, you love your parents, um, then again, sometimes you act against them. You defy them. Mm. Um, because either your friends are doing the same thing, so you just more or less kind of go along, the, go along with them, but mm. at the end of the day, you still love your parents. Yeah. So, in okay. that sense, it seems to me like he's being spoiled. How many of you, how many of you have actually seen this video? Hmm. Could you send the link? I don't think it's available online. It is. I, I showed it last week to someone. Okay. That's on the YouTube. I will use it on the YouTube channel. Okay. Oh. 
one of the acts of initiation is they appear to urinate into food which they then give these workers who are on their knees to ingest. How do you square that with the intimacy, the other stuff? That never made sense to me. So, when the workers and the, in the reconciliation ceremony sat in this room, this very room, the four boys sat over here, and I call them boys because in my estimation they're not men. Men don't behave like that. And the workers sat there, there, with their families. The white guys came alone. Their families are ashamed of them. Not ashamed of them, but ashamed of the event. Here's the most curious thing to this day, the one guy that I employed here actually, Downey. They still don't think they did anything wrong. And you know what? I believe them. I don't believe they didn't do anything wrong. That is heinous, unacceptable, deeply racist. That, of course, I do it. But I believe them when they say they don't know what they did wrong. I really do. Well, yeah, because right and wrong is all about perception. So then your perception is your reality. Mm -hmm. and their culture and how they've been brought up that was all okay with how they were brought up. They're supposed to do those types of things. That's okay. You're absolutely right. So, in terms of their frame of reference, they can't see what the problem is. And when I met one of the fathers, a huge farmer who came to see me, he sat in my office crying. I'll never forget his words to me. He said in Afrikaans, Please just tell me what did my son do wrong? Now, if the father doesn't get it, how the hell is these kids going to be? And you know what? Initially, I was like offended. I said, Are you nuts? I said, What if the workers were white? You know, I went through all that. But on reflection, they genuinely didn't know it was wrong. But how do they justify it being right? They would say the following, you know what, we know these workers. We asked them to engage in a play which we wanted to record, to enter for a competition, in which we're protesting, which is our democratic right, racial integration. We didn't mean it to be interpreted the way you guys are. And by the way, they agreed to do it. It wasn't like the black workers, because remember, be careful of another slip you can make here, which is to sort of say the black workers were helpless victims. They were not. They made the decision to drink all that beer in the lunchtime, to run up and down with these kids. You know, Archbishop Tutu's take on that when he was here was, well, they were too powerless to know they were being harmed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the arch, but I don't know. You see, I've seen them interact. I've seen the black woman say to the white guys, come over here, I swear to God, and come and greet my husband. That doesn't sound to me like a victim. That sounds to me like somebody who knew what she was doing, somebody who's in charge. That must be explained, and I just don't think we got a good grip on, on, on that. So I thought about this, okay? And just keep going. Then I came across this guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of you know this fellow? Yes. Tell me about it. Donald Sterling, the uh, former, or maybe current, former, oh, former. <laughs> owner of the LA Clippers. <laughs> basketball team of largely African-American men, but he didn't want his alleged girlfriend to hang out with African-American men um, in public because he didn't think too much of them. Mm -hmm. Right? Here's a black, straight Mexican woman 
who, by the way, is stunning. <laughs> and yes, Donald Sterling, who, by the way, just lost the Clippers because they said he wasn't meant to be. The judge just ruled he's not meant to be. He's got a dark-skinned woman next to him, and he tells this very woman, not uh, as you correctly said, but black people, it's not good for her or good for him. How do you explain that? You see the problem? That you, it's perfectly possible to have racism and intimacy coexist. Yeah. I think sometimes people have a tendency to separate individuals from their larger societal Excellent. Um, perceptions and ideologies. Mm -hmm. So. You're not like that, but that doesn't change what you think of everyone else in the group. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and that for me is obviously something that needs to be theoretically explained, okay? And that's what I'm trying to, to, to work on. So obviously, when, as you correctly said, students come here, both black and white students, by the way, with deeply entrenched understandings of who the enemy is, and still is, how do you change that? as a leader. And how do you change that as a black leader in my case, whose biography is implicated in this? It's not like I come to work emotionless, mm -hmm. right? And how do I, would you excuse the language, swallow all the shit that I see every day? Mm -hmm. Because I have to maintain an even keel. Mm -hmm. I have to insist 